it's now time to introduce our special guest. We're thrilled to have with us tonight, Shivam Joshi, MD. Dr. Shivam Joshi is an internist, nephrologist, and plant-based physician practicing at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. He is a faculty member of NYU School of Medicine with research interests in plant-based diets, evolutionary diets, fad diets, and nephrology. And I'd like to just mention one more detail about Dr. Joshi. He has just gotten engaged to be married right here in Hawaii on Sunday. <laughs> and I want to congratulate him and his new fiance, Dr. Uh, Bijal Patel. So please extend that. <laughs> She's not here tonight, but please extend that up. congratulations. And our warmest wishes. Really appreciate your coming here at a time like this. Dr. Joshi's presentation tonight is entitled Plant-Based Diets in Chronic Kidney Disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shiva Joshi. Thank you everyone for having me and uh, thank you for uh, congratulating me. It's, it's been a, a very eventful week. Um, <laughs> she said yes. <laughs> so, so what do the kidneys do? So the kidneys are organs within the body. Everyone has two of them. They perform a variety of important functions, including regulating blood pressure. They control electrolytes. They make vitamin D. They also regulate how much blood you have in the body. Uh, they make urine. They control volume. We, we overlook the kidneys, but they actually are very important, and they serve a lot of functions. Everyone has, for the most part, two kidneys. Some people are born with one kidney. Most people have two kidneys, and each one's about the size of a fist, maybe a little bit larger. And what they do is they filter about 140 liters of blood uh, per day and make one to two liters of urine. So when I explain to patients the job of the kidney or how important the kidneys are, imagine not having kidneys and then drinking one, two liters every day and that fluidness never coming out. So urine is a product of what the kidneys do and you can see um, them doing that every time you urinate. And the kidneys do receive a lot of blood. Uh, they're so important they get about a quarter of the blood uh, from the body. Going into the kidney, so this is what a kidney looks like if you were, uh, to slice it from top to bottom. The filtering unit, there's about a million of these units, they're called nephrons, which is why our field is called nephrology, uh, which is meaning the study of the nephron. And in each kidney, there's about a million of them. Uh, as we age, the number of nephrons does decline. Within each nephron, there's actually two, two big parts, a thing we call a glomerulus, which is kind of like a filter and then these tubules which then function as pumps and they uh, pull things out of what will become the urine or put things in uh, to the right balance that we need for our body. And this all, all leads me to uh, really why I do what I do and why I'm here speaking today is because chronic kidney disease is common. About one in seven people in America has it, uh, about 14 or 15 percent of the population. And then the number of people who do have kidney disease does uh, increase when we have hypertension or diabetes. About one in three people with diabetes has chronic kidney disease, which I'll explain what that is, and one in five with high blood pressure. So what is chronic kidney disease? There's three, or four rather, major criteria for chronic kidney disease. One is a decrease in the kidney's ability to filter out these toxins. It's graded by a number. So if anyone's had any blood work done, you might see a lab test or something that says creatinine. With that, there might be a number called a GFR, and that GFR number measures actually how much blood is being filtered by the kidneys. It's called the glomerular filtration rate. For many people, that number is listed as greater than 60, which is, uh, can be normal, but in some people, it can be a sign of kidney disease. And there's five stages of kidney disease, stage one being the earliest, stage two being the next, stage three being moderate disease, and then so on, with stage five being end stage, and then when people unfortunately need dialysis. And this is tested by uh, blood work, but you can also have signs of kidney disease in the urine. So uh, many patients only have their blood tested, but you also need to have your urine tested to make sure you don't have kidney problems affecting either the blood or the urine. The last way, which is a kind of a minor way of diagnosing kidney disease is by imaging. If you have any anatomical abnormalities of the kidney, say one kidney is a little bit smaller, uh, or, sh or shrunken, or is there something else going on, you could qualify for having kidney disease that way. 
And uh, I do include a little bit of jokes in here. So this just says, you've got to be kidneying me. And, uh, and so this is the, the lab test I was talking about called creatinine. So th these are actually my labs. And you can see my creatinine. Uh, I didn't want to put someone else's labs. But uh, the, my creatinine is a 0 0.8. It doesn't list that GFR number. Uh, but if we were able to calculate it out, it would say uh, normal or GFR greater than 60. Creatinine is actually found in the blood. It's affected by a number of things, uh, by muscle mass, how much meat we eat or don't eat. And then low creatinine generally means that the kidneys are doing a good job, but there are uh, circumstances that that could be affected by. So the, the big question is, and the reason and really why I'm here is to answer this question. So is animal-based foods bad for the kidneys? You're in luck. <laughs> And the answer is, well, perhaps the evidence is limited. So I'll show you what I, what I have found over months and if not years at this point, looking into uh, the answer for this. So for patients without chronic kidney disease, so for, for patients or for people who don't have any kidney problems, the average person who doesn't have any kidney problems whatsoever, what is the evidence that animal-based foods could be problematic for the kidneys? And there is some from looking at studies from uh, observational literature, meaning not using experiments. There's a handful of cross-sectional studies that show that those consuming the highest amount of plant foods have been associated with a lower risk of protein in the urine, so that's having a problem in the urine, and developing kidney disease itself, which is generally the problem with the blood. Animal foods have been associated with the opposite, and then in one study, replacing 3% of energy from animal protein with vegetable protein lowered the prevalence ratio for association of renal function impairment to 0 0.20, meaning that there was 80% reduction in those associated with kidney disease by replacing animal protein with plant protein. That's from cross-sectional studies, from prospective cohort studies, so meaning instead of doing a snapshot in time, they follow people over time, follow a group of people living in society and follow what happens to them. Those consuming, again, the highest amount of plant foods have been associated with a lower risk of kidney disease, kidney failure, meaning your kidneys have become so bad that you need a dialysis or a transplant, protein in the urine, and then a rapid decline in kidney function. And then again, animal foods have been associated with the opposite. And in the same way, I highlight uh, a couple studies here. So one study replacing one serving of red processed meat with legumes daily was associated with a 30% reduced risk of kidney disease. And then in another study, replacing one serving of red meat with soy and legumes was associated with a 50% reduced risk of developing kidney failure. So there is evidence that plant foods are better for kidneys uh, compared to animal foods for people who don't have kidney disease. And then what about people who do have kidney disease? What are the effects of animal protein on the health of those kidneys? There was a study called the Nurses' Health Study, which followed a group of health professionals for 11 years, uh, 1,624 women. But what they found was that with women who did have kidney disease, a GFR, again, that number of between 55 and 80, had a decline in renal function for every 10 gram increase in total protein intake. And when they looked at which foods were significant, it was actually non-dairy animal protein. And that, that was actually what was most significant. For every 10 gram increase in animal protein intake, there was an increased risk of developing uh, worsened chronic kidney disease. And you can see that by the solid black line that is going up. There are only a handful of experimental studies. So when we look at observational studies, we can't control everything. So experimental studies like your randomized controlled trials control everything in theory and then are able to test one variable. And these types of studies, we only have really four studies. And three of them kind of tested the same thing. And two of them actually were, were very similar to each other. One of the studies looked at diabetics for seven weeks, and another study looked at 41 diabetics for five years. And in, bo in both sets of these studies, they were looking at patients who had protein already in the urine, and they were looking to see how adjusting their diet, whether replacing it with plant protein or animal protein, affected how much protein they had in the urine. And what they found was that people who were eating the plant protein had less protein in their urine compared to people who were eating animal protein. And that was ultimately confirmed in a, yet a third study, which was also a randomized controlled trial of, and again, 14 diabetics over eight weeks. To illustrate uh, this point, I included this graph, which shows that in the soy protein intervention, protein, in, 
protein in the urine decreased, which is the bar going below the zero, and then protein in the urine actually increased in people who are on dairy protein, uh, casein. And then I wanted to talk about this Ford study, which is important in the literature because it was also a clinical trial of about 11 patients each. And they went from eating an unrestricted protein intake to a special vegan diet, and they looked at what happened in their kidney function. And then they had another group of people who were on a conventional low-protein diet to a special vegan diet. They called it a special vegan diet because when the study was done in 1994, it was thought that you couldn't just eat a regular vegan diet because it had to be special because you had to complement. But that idea has been debunked. But that's the terminology they use, and that's the terminology I, I quoted here. But what I wanted to show is that their kidney function, and some people say, well, kidney function went down when people ate the special vegan diet, which is called SVD. But really what's happening here is that actually the kidney function may have gotten, may have even gotten better over the long run. Because what was happening is that, and we've, we see this from time to time, is that many people who eat animal-based diets eat a lot of protein. And that can cause the kidneys to work harder. So when people switch to a plant-based diet, uh, the kidneys may work less and there may not be a need for the kidneys to operate at such a high level. And this was illustrated in a similar study uh, looking at people eating high protein versus low protein diets called MDRD. For an, anyone in the dialysis or nephrologic community, the secondary analysis showed that eating a low protein diet over the long term was beneficial compared to those eating a high protein diet. That reduction in hyperfiltration is maybe what we're seeing here. And I'm going to talk about hyperfiltration actually right now. So hyperfiltration is this phenomenon where eating too much protein perhaps strains the kidneys. It causes the kidneys to work harder to excrete all the protein and nitrogenous waste products that are found in protein-rich foods. The other reasons that animal protein may be detrimental to kidney function includes the acid content of those foods, which we're going to talk about momentarily, and the changes in the microbiome, specifically the lack of fiber, and the generation of this compound called TMAO. Sodium content, inflammation, lack of phytonutrients, there's a lot of reasons why plant foods may be better for the kidneys over an animal-based foods. And I'm gonna talk about some of these throughout this talk. So going back to the hyperfiltration issue, this is really what hyperfiltration is. So when you look at people that who are vegan, vegetarian, omnivores, and look at their average GFR, that means the, the average level that their kidneys are functioning. This is, a, the GFR is that number that measures the blood flow to the kidneys and how much the kidneys are filtering the blood over a period of time. So a normal number is anywhere between 100 and 120. It could vary based on age and a variety of things. And as you can see, vegans are at 100. And then vegetarians are at 105 and omnivores are at 113. Some might say, well, omnivores have a higher GFR, so then they have a better kidney function. But again, that could also mean because they're eating more protein that the kidneys are working harder. And right below that, I show that people who are omnivores eat more protein, but perhaps not to their benefit. So vegans eat about 82 grams per day, so they're certainly not protein deficient. Vegetarians, 93 grams of protein per day, and omnivores, 112 grams per day. The real question is, is hyperfiltration caused by quantity or quality? We definitely know quantity affects it, but we also think quality affects it too, and I'm about to show you a study showing that. So this just goes into hyperfiltration, and it's talking how high-protein diets can cause this uh, phenomenon of the kidneys working harder to get rid of the protein being consumed. And we think that eating excess protein and this phenomenon of hyperfiltration is bad for those who have chronic kidney disease but perhaps not so bad for people who don't have chronic kidney disease. Excess protein is in those without kidney disease generally not harmful, and there's a handful of studies showing that. And, but excess protein in those with kidney disease is likely harmful. So this is maybe one reason why eating excess animal protein in those with kidney disease is not a good idea. The evidence for benefit of low-protein diets, again, it was showed in that study, MDRD, for those in the nephrology community. And then the secondary analysis did, did show uh, a benefit. So going back to that question, do plant foods cause less hyperfiltration? Or rephrased, if, if excess dietary protein in general causes hyperfiltration, do plants cause less of this phenomenon? And there's really only one experiment within all the studies out there to offer any insight. 
And as you can see here, those people eating an animal protein diet had those black solid black circles on the left on the graph, and those people eating the vegetable-based diets actually had a decrease in this phenomenon called hyperfiltration with the open circles on the right. So this suggests if you keep protein constant, which they did in this study, there is less hyperfiltration when people eat plant-based foods, which suggests that perhaps plant foods are more beneficial for the kidney, but this was a limited study. They only tested people for about three weeks. Longer than that, we don't, we don't really know, and that's unfortunate. Are all plant foods the same? Most, most definitely not. So this was a study recently done which compared people who are eating a healthy plant-based diet and an unhealthy plant-based diet. Because one of the common questions I get in our clinic uh, in New York is that, doctor, I've, I switched over to being vegan. All I eat are Oreos and french fries. Why haven't I lost weight? So this is kind of similar for kidney disease. People who eat a healthy plant-based diet were associated with a lower risk of kidney disease, a hazard ratio of 0.85 and those eating an unhealthy plant-based diet were associated with a higher risk of kidney disease. And then your question might be, oh, what, what do they use to define a healthy plant-based diet? On the left, what they used was fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, legumes, and then tea and coffee. They did leave, you know, coffee in there, which is good. And then unhealthy, not plant-based diet foods included your refined grains, potatoes, fruit juices, sugar, and beverages, sweets, desserts, animal fat, dairy, meat, fish, seafood, and eggs. What is interesting is that they lumped all types of potatoes in there, including your baked potato and your fried potato, which I think was unfair to the lowly potato. I, I personally don't think potatoes are all that bad unless you deep fry them, french fry them, etc. I, I threw a lot of information at you and I feel that all of you deserved a little bit of a some comedic relief here. So these are some famous kidneys. We have Billy the Kidney, Nicole Kidney, Hello Kidney, John F. Kidney, The Kidney and I, and then my favorite, Kidney Rock. So now I wanted to talk about the likely benefits of a plant-based diet. And some of these affect, uh, some of these are more relevant for people who actually have kidney disease. And these are many of the complications that patients with kidney disease deal with. For example, one of them is phosphate. And we'll go through and talk about a handful of others. And even if you don't have kidney disease or don't know anyone, there's some aspects of this that are still relevant and important. Phosphate levels rise in kidney disease. So phosphate is one of those things that we never pay attention to. We never get tested for it. We don't look for the labels. Well, you can't look for labels because they're not on nutrition labels. But it's, it, we don't really think about it ever because the kidneys do the, do, do the job of regulating phosphate levels for us so we don't have to worry about it. But for people who have kidney disease, phosphate levels accumulate because the kidneys aren't able to excrete it out in the urine. And what happens is that as those levels rise in the blood, they do bad things in the body, including increasing the risk of death for people who have chronic kidney disease or uh, end-stage renal disease. And then because of this, people are told to eat less phosphate. What's interesting is that even though plant-based foods have phosphate in them, a lot of that phosphate is not absorbed. It's bound as this, in this thing called phytate. So all that phosphate usually gets excreted out and is never resorbed and is never of consequence. But because the phosphate is there, many patients with kidney disease are told to unfortunately avoid these foods. And actually, these foods actually may be beneficial and they actually may help lower phosphate levels and uh, have other beneficial effects. And the reason we can't absorb much of the phosphate in plant-based foods is because we don't have this enzyme called phytase. You need phytase to digest phytate to absorb the phosphate, and we don't have phytase. For patients and providers in the nephrology and kidney community, there's this thing called the rule of thirds, which goes over about how much phosphate is avail bioavailable or is absorbed in the blood. So about a third of plant foods is absorbed, about two thirds of phosphate in meat and dairy is absorbed, and then about 100% of the phosphate in processed foods and sodas is absorbed. So plant foods are at the lowest level. Proving that there was this small study uh, in patients who had chronic kidney disease stage three and four, and basically what it showed is that people who were on a vegetarian diet compared to those who were on an omnivorous diet had a lower phosphate level in their blood. And so it was essentially uh, proof of the concept. There is a caveat, there's always a caveat to many of these things. The caveat to this is that bread, for example, is a plant-based food, but industrial processing, for example, baking, can cause the phytate to break free. If you are cooking the food yourself in your kitchen, you're likely not processing the food enough to cause the phytate to break free. 
But if the food has been made by a factory or has gone through industrial processing, which involves high levels of heat greater than 140 degrees Celsius in the form of example uh, baked bread, then you may be getting a higher amount of phosphate from those foods if you have chronic kidney disease. Another important complication of patients who have chronic kidney disease is acid levels. And for, for many of us, we don't really worry about this because the kidneys do that job for us. The kidneys are working, they do what they're supposed to do, and they re regulate how much acid and base we have in our blood. But for patients with kidney disease, this is very important for them because the kidneys cannot do the job that they were meant to do. The kidneys lower acid levels in our blood. That one of, that's one of the many jobs they do. The, the kidneys are tasked with many functions, uh, so it's unfortunate when we, when we lose kidneys. So acid levels rise in kidney disease. But what's interesting is that actually dietary proteins are the predominant source of acid in our diet, and specifically animal-based foods. So the more animal-based foods you're eating, the more acid you're getting from those foods. And for patients with kidney disease, neutralizing that acid is very important because it actually can slow down the progression of your kidney disease. Because once the kidneys are gone, they're gone. So doing everything you can to slow down the progression of the kidney disease is very worthwhile. This just goes back to showing which foods are high in acid levels. The average acid load in American diet is between 50 and 75 milliequivalents per day. The most of the acid comes from animal protein, like I was saying. Base comes in the form of fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables have little to no acid and actually have base. They have bicarb or baking soda or forms of it in the foods themselves. So you can actually neutralize the amount of acid you're eating in your diet by eating more plant-based foods. And that's actually the, the next few slides. The current treatment right now for patients with kidney disease is to pres literally prescribe baking soda. For some of my patients who could not afford copays for the, the pill form of baking soda, I would tell them to go buy Arm & Hammer baking soda and pour it out and do a teaspoon a day. So that would neutralize the acid in their foods. But what's better is actually to get the base or the, the neutralization effect of baking soda from the foods themselves, from fruits and vegetables. And that's really the best way to go. Uh, fruits and vegetables have natural alkali or base in them. What's been shown is that when you put fruits and vegetables against Arm & Hammer baking soda, fruits and vegetables actually do better in a number of other ways. They do what they're supposed to do in terms of neutralizing the acid, but they also help with weight loss, help with blood pressure, and they reduce the amount of protein in the urine. Because of this, a pair of physicians wrote an article back a few years ago. They said that the title of the article was The Key to Halting Progression of CKD, Chronic Kidney Disease might be in the produce market and not in the pharmacy. And how appropriate the title of that. This was a, a study of patients on fruits and vegetables compared to those who were on taking the, the baking soda. What's interesting is that the baking soda slowed down the progression of kidney disease shown by the black uh, dotted line and then the smaller dotted line was the baking soda. And then the solid line was no alkali or no uh, base. What happens when you don't get any base is that kidney disease progresses faster. So this was proof that eating a plant-based diet is as good as taking pills from the pharmacy. Yet another study showed that it may not be just the acid affecting the kidneys. So th this was a study, a cross-sectional study, looking at people who were eating acid in foods and then their risk of developing end-stage renal disease and the risk of end-stage renal disease was highest in those who were eating the foods with the most amount of acid, which is interesting. High blood pressure is a common complication of kidney disease. With kidney disease, uh, the blood pressure goes up for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is that the kidneys, one of the jobs of the kidney is to excrete salt in the urine, but because if, if the kidneys aren't working well, they're not able to excrete salt or sodium and then blood pressure increases. And there's a variety of other ways that blood pressure increases, but th this part is also relevant because hypertension is very common. Uh, there's about 102 million Americans who have high blood pressure, regardless if they have kidney disease or not. Prevalence rises with age, so at age 45, without hypertension, your 40-year risk of developing high blood pressure is somewhere between 80 and 90 percent across ethnicities, which is unfortunate. If you don't have high blood pressure, at some point you probably will, unless, of course, you're part of VSH and eating a whole foods plant-based diet. I'm sure this won't apply to anyone here, but 
the take home message is that many people eating in rural areas don't have high elevations and high blood pressure. This was shown in, in several important studies in rural Kenya and rural China. The foundation of the DASH diet actually got its origins in looking at people who are eating a plant-based diet in industrialized society. If people eating plant-based diets in indigenous societies had low blood pressure, what about those eating in industrialized societies? And some of the lo lowest blood pressures seen in industrialized society were uh, documented in strict vegetarians living in Massachusetts. This was a study that they were referring to when uh, people talk about that. It was looking at people living in East Boston and uh, whether they were eating a omnivorous diet, a lacto-vegetarian diet, or a strict vegetarian or vegan diet. And the strict vegetarians had the lowest blood pressures in terms of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. One of the common criticisms I get is uh, from people who don't believe this or uh, want to challenge this is that, well, people eating plant-based diets are slimmer and we know that losing weight reduces your blood pressure. Yes, that is definitely true, but not all of the effect of the blood pressure reduction is from just being slimmer. So even after you control for that, eating a plant-based diet still reduces blood pressure. This was one study that showed that. And then this is another study that showed that. So this shows the reductions in blood pressure with and without adjusting for BMI. In the top left, uh, without adjusting for BMI, both systolic and diastolic reductions were about six or seven millimeters of mercury. And after adjusting for BMI, it was about four millimeters of mercury. And then in the bottom table, for people within one category of BMI, so people who had a normal BMI, blood pressure again was lowest amongst those who were eating a vegan diet and it progressed that way as you went from non-vegetarian to partial to lacto-ovo and then ultimately to vegan. Again, another study showing that, this is from Epic Oxford. Half of the variation in blood pressure is explained by being of a lower weight, but the other half is explained by eating these foods, which are, have inherent properties in lowering blood pressure. And I'll explain why momentarily. And yet, here's another study showing the same thing. And what this also showed was that Eating any sort of animal protein was associated with an increase in blood pressure. And this went for red meat, processed meat, but also seafood and poultry. So one of the many things patients say, well, I do eat healthy, I eat a lot of chicken or I eat a lot of seafood, but then I referenced this study to show that these foods have been associated in several large cohorts to be causes of high blood pressure. Eating plant-based diets ultimately went into formulation of the DASH study, which is the very popular study to lower blood pressure dietary approach to stop hypertension. These pre-DASH trials uh, were done in Australia, and they randomized people to eating a plant-based diet versus not, and those eating plant-based diets did have a uh, reduction in blood pressure. The rationale of the DASH diet, I'm sure many of you know, is that these diet design goals were to create a pattern that would have the blood pressure lowering benefits of a vegetarian diet yet contain enough animal products to make them palatable to non-vegetarians, which is very interesting. So the DASH diet as constructed randomized 459 adults to three diets. It control a diet rich in fruits and vegetables but it was also high in fat. And then the DASH diet, which was fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy, and with reduced saturated fat and total fat. And what this showed is that eating a DASH diet had the lowest reductions in blood pressure, but in the, the quote-unquote fruit and vegetarian diet came in the middle, and the controlled diet uh, lowered the blood pressure the least. But I had some issues with the fruit and vegetarian diet because this diet also had more beef, pork, and ham in it, and then also more servings of oil and not as many fruits and vegetables, uh, ironically. So one of the questions I often get from patients is that, can changing my diet really lower my blood pressure? When I get this question, I reference this study, which was a secondary analysis of the DASH low sodium diet, which showed that people who reduced their sodium intake and also ate a DASH style diet could reduce their blood pressure by a lot. How much? This is about 21 or 22 millimeters of mercury over eight millimeters of mercury. So this is like going from 150 over 90 systolic and diastolic to 129 over 82 systolic over diastolic. So this is a huge reduction. This is going from uncontrolled high blood pressure to having uh, blood pressure under control. So my, my question is, can a exclusively plant-based diet improve this uh, reduction in blood pressure even more? And we don't know that, but it is uh, a question worth pondering. And one of the reasons animal protein 
may raise blood pressure is because of the inherent properties of the amino acids. So some of the amino acids found in animal-based protein have been associated with raising blood pressure, whereas some of the amino acids in plant-based foods have been associated with reducing blood pressure. So the ones that raise blood pressure include uh, methionine and alanine, and the ones that have been associated with reducing blood pressure include threonine and histidine. These unfavorable amino acid types are just one reason why blood pressure may increase in those eating animal-based foods and, and why it may be lower in those eating plant-based foods. But the other reasons include the sodium content, the potassium content, the weight which we talked about, and other things like oxidative stress and natural alkali. Diabetes is important to talk about because even though we don't think about it as, with kidney disease, it's actually the most common cause of kidney disease. So to talk about kidney disease without talking about the most common cause is like mopping up the floor without turning off the sink, the, the famous adage that we, we talk about in the uh, plant-based world. 115 million Americans either have diabetes or prediabetes. Uh, their lifetime risk of developing prediabetes is 50%, the lifetime risk of developing diabetes is about 33%. The lifetime risk of developing prediabetes is so high that even my, I myself have had prediabetes before. It's very easy to get it as you gain weight. I don't have it anymore, but that's probably because I eat a whole food plant-based diet. And the studies do show that people who, who move towards eating less animal protein have a lower risk of developing diabetes, the stepwise progression as you move along that spectrum, with vegans having the lowest and the non-vegetarians having a higher, the highest amount. What's interesting is that it's been shown that reversing diabetic kidney disease has possible with a pancreas transplant. And this was shown uh, a couple decades ago in people who got a pancreas transplant for type 1 diabetes. Not only do they reverse their diabetes, they also reverse their kidney disease. And because of this idea, and also knowing these facts that plant-based diets treat type 2 diabetes, and then plant-based diets can also reverse diabetes, that it may be possible to reverse diabetic kidney disease with a plant-based diet as well. This has not been proven, but this was the subject of my poster that I presented at the NKF now more than uh, a year ago. What I hypothesize here is that people with type 2 diabetes, if they adopt a whole food plant-based diet and reverse their diabetes, they may be able to also reverse their diabetic kidney disease. So hopefully the research in the future will come to shed light on that. A common question I get as a kidney doctor is kidney stones. Kidney stones are very painful, but they are also caused by diet, so they could, can potentially be preventable. Prevalence of kidney stones is 8.8%, and it is increasing, and, it, and the net number may be even higher now. So it affects about 1 in 11 people. The most common type of stone is called a calcium oxalate stone, and most stones that people have are this type of stone. And the risk, risk of recurrence is high. The link between stones and animal protein goes back to the end of World War II. And there's been an association of people eating more animal protein and having more kidney stones. For several decades now, people have been writing to this effect should recurrent calcium oxalate stone formers, meaning people who have uh, repeated episodes of kidney stones, become vegetarians. And it's a good question. And the reason is, is because stone formers should be advised to limit the intake of all animal proteins, including fish. The reason being is that animal protein level, animal protein consumption raises the levels of all things that are needed to make a kidney stone. So in order to make a kidney stone in your urine, you need the right ingredients, kind of like how to make anything else as you would. Calcium, oxalate, uric acid, and then acidity. All of these things are important in forming a stone, be it a calcium oxalate stone or a uric acid stone. Animal protein increases the level of these substances. For calcium oxalate stone formers, treatment is actually animal protein and sodium restriction and not calcium restriction. It's been established for quite some time that treatment for stones is reducing animal protein intake, but unfortunately, the, the message is not always conveyed. And to underscore this point, vegetarians do have a lower risk of kidney stones. That has been documented in the literature. And this was an interesting study it's coming from England and Scotland, about 50,000 people were studied, and they showed that vegetarians have a 31% reduced risk of having a kidney stone, whereas the people eating the most amount of meat in this study had an increased risk of developing a kidney stone. And in this case, a 64% increased risk of developing a kidney stone. Stones and plant proteins. So I mentioned why animal protein could be bad for stones, but plant protein could be, benefit, could be beneficial in many of the opposite ways. So plant protein, uh, lowers urine acidity, lowers urine uric acid, 
lowers urine calcium excretion, sodium excretion, and increases urine citrate. Citrate is um, a base, uh, very similar to uh, baking soda. Interestingly enough, for people who have kidney stones, have problematic kidney stones, recurrent kidney stones, especially of the calcium oxalate type, which is the most common type of kidney stone, potassium citrate is prescribed. But when you think about potassium citrate, it's actually components of plants just placed in pill form. Potassium is commonly found in plant foods, so is citrate. And the reason potassium citrate is prescribed is because of this reason, is because an alkaline ash diet is difficult to follow for most patients. So uh, translation is just eating a whole foods plant-based diet would be too difficult for many people. So the current treatment is to just prescribe someone empirically uh, potassium citrate, which is unfortunate and has a similar themes as a DASH diet where animal protein uh, was included because eating a whole food plant-based diet was thought to be unpalatable or, or too difficult. So for many of my patients, I actually tell them uh, to eat a whole foods plant-based diet to get potassium and citrate for their kidney stones. One of the important caveats of stones is this issue of hyperoxaluria or having too much oxalate in the urine. Oxalate is found in certain foods like spinach, beet greens, Swiss chard. Eating too much of those foods, especially in quantities that are unnatural, for example, blending bags of spinach into three or four green smoothies a day, can exceed your body's ability to excrete the oxalate and can cause stones. But for most people, eating a normal amount of these foods is not problematic, and there are several reasons why. One is that reducing the amount of oxalate that you eat does not always affect the amount of oxalate in your urine for the average person. And the reason being is that animal protein actually affects more how much, how much oxalate it can be in your urine. The other thing is that increasing the amount of oxalate you take in within reason also helps support bacteria in your gut who use that oxalate and then actually digest that oxalate for you. And there's bacteria like oxalobacter formigenes who actually increase in their colony count with the more amount of oxalate foods being consumed in the diet, which is very interesting. So as I was saying, animal protein does not contain oxalate, but increases the urinary excretion of oxalate. And then oxalate is found in plant foods. And the other thing is that patients who do have this issue with too much oxalate in the urine, which is a minority of patients, uh, should have their urine monitored, but most people do just fine uh, who don't have this issue. People who are at risk for having too much oxalate in their urine are people who are using vitamin C supplementation, who've had surgery to their gut, which affects absorption of oxalate, people on antibiotics frequently, and people with, who have bowel disease or gastrointestinal disease. So in, in, in patients who have those issues, I recommend avoiding certain high oxalate foods, but the average person generally can do just fine. Uric acid stones are the second most common type of stone. There's two ways to reduce the amount of uric acid in your urine. Uh, one is through medication and the other way is to reduce animal protein. And then by reducing animal protein, you actually can have a 93% reduction in the risk of having uh, uric acid crystallization, which is one of the first steps to having a uric acid stone. Importantly, Vegetarians do have lower levels of uric acid uh, in the blood compared to non-vegetarians, and also plant foods do not increase the risk of gout or hyperuricemia. I briefly want to talk about TMAO. TMAO is commonly uh, discussed in the cardiology literature, but it has important implications for kidney disease. So in brief, dietary choline, which comes from eggs, dairy, shellfish, and fish, and then also carnitine, red meat, is converted, is converted by gut flora into trimethylamine, and then it is converted TMAO by the liver. TMAO does not appear in people who don't eat these foods, uh, for example, uh, people who are vegan, and then it does not appear in those rece people uh, receiving antibiotics, but it does promote atherosclerosis. What's interesting is that TMAO levels increase with kidney disease, but they get better after kidney transplantation and they're also a predictor of atherosclerotic burden and long-term mortality. And this is an example of uh, TMA levels, levels increasing with increasing kidney disease, and then decreasing after transplant, and then finally conferring uh, increased risk of death as TMA levels increase. TMAO actually 
also is a uh, risk factor for kidney disease itself. So having too, many, too high a level of TMAO has been associated with kidney disease as well, which is interesting. Mortality, uh, very important. Mortality rate is high for patients with kidney disease, which is why it makes uh, the work of preventing kidney disease, slowing down kidney disease, and if possible, reversing kidney disease so important. This is an issue that is kind of a black eye in the field of nephrology because so many of our patients ultimately do not make it to dialysis because they pass away. Those with kidney disease are 16 to 40 times more likely to die than to end up on dialysis. It's that high. And the other issue is that if you do make it to dialysis, the five-year survival is, is, um, is rather abysmal. It's about 40 to 45 percent, which is worse than many people with early stage lung cancer, to put it in perspective. And the reason I mention this is because plant-based foods have been associated with a reduction in mortality. So this is looking at people who had chronic kidney disease but were, did not have kidney failure. And people eating more plant-based foods, including uh, fruits, vegetables, legumes, cereals, whole grains, fiber, had a reduced risk of dying uh, over time. And then again, similarly, this was shown in people on dialysis. Dialysis patients eat so little plant foods that they measure the number of servings uh, over the course of a week and not per day. So the mean number of fruits and vegetables consumed was actually eight per week. I'm sure there's many of you in the audience who probably get that amount in a day's time but dialysis patients are actually actively counseled for reasons that are outdated, in my opinion, to not eat plant foods, and that's why they eat so little. And that may be one reason why mortality could be so high, because those eating more were associated with having um, a lower risk of dying. Fiber is really interesting, and I have just one slide on it. Fiber was used more than 30 years ago as a way to help treat kidney failure. The reason being is that it reduced the amount of nitrogenous waste that accumulated in the blood from eating too much protein, especially in those who had kidney problems. Fiber has also been now shown to uh, been as be associated with a reduced risk of dying for those with kidney disease. Uh, for in one study, every extra gram of fiber was associated with 11% reduction in cardiovascular disease. When patients ask me what's the healthiest diet I can eat, for my kidneys, I often tell them it's a whole, for kidneys in themselves, it's a whole foods, plant-based diet. And what's exciting for many people is the concept of reversing disease. And I talked to you about the possibility of reversing diabetic kidney disease with a whole foods, plant-based diet, which is theoretical. But what is not theoretical and has been discussed in the literature is actually uh, Dr. Brooke Goldner's case series of two patients who I know was here at this uh, podium not too long ago discussing plant-based diets. This study, uh, case series that she wrote actually discusses people who had lupus and kidney disease from the lupus, which is very common in lupus, and then it improving, if not reversing, with a whole foods plant-based diet, which is very impressive. Another example of someone reversing their kidney disease, uh, this time minimal change disease, is this gentleman named Dane, Dwayne Sunwald, who I've had the privilege of meeting. He writes in this paper uh, that by replacing animal protein, plant protein, plant-based protein, I was able to put my chronic kidney disease into remission. I present his whole story here, which um, I'll, I'll spare for right now. What happened was that he developed a pretty profound kidney disease at a point of almost kidney failure and had failed multiple lines of intense immunosuppression uh, some medications used even in chemotherapy, and it wasn't until he adopted a whole foods plant-based diet and started swimming that he lost weight and turned his life around. It was uh, so impressive and life-changing for him and many people who read his story uh, that he wrote about it, he's uh, extremely grateful. And, and in brief, I, I read his words, I appreciate the recommendations my doctor gave me about making dietary modifications. Replace your protein intake with plant-based protein. This one change has had a monumental impact on my life. I've gained back a quality of life that I thought was gone forever. My benchmark for normal has been my ability to keep up with my professional work demands and still be able to ex exercise. For the past seven months, I now swim 5,000 meters every other day, a distance that surpasses my pre-kidney disease life. I perceived I lived a healthy lifestyle before kidney disease. Today, I live a healthier, happier lifestyle, and I have my kidneys to thank for it. It's really amazing. Uh, in brief, I just for, for those within the nephrology community, I just want to talk about a couple things and uh, pass through these relatively quickly. Potassium is one of the issues that patients who are on 
dialysis or of kidney disease have been told to actually avoid eating plant-based foods because of the fear of having too much potassium in your blood. So commonly we think of bananas having potassium, but actually all plant foods have potassium. Um, and bananas actually aren't that high. There's other foods that have even more potassium. But what's interesting is that eating these foods doesn't necessarily translate to having more potassium in your blood. When you look at through the literature, and I've gone through and put red boxes, many of the cases of people who do have high potassium while eating plant-based foods actually were in cases of people eating sauces and juices. So they, in these forms, you're able to eat, for example, eight oranges worth of potassium by drinking a glass of OJ than actually eating those oranges themselves. And I, I think that's really the issue. So eating and consuming plant-based foods is okay, but when you start processing them into the forms of sauces and juices, you're kind of extracting the potassium and then getting more than you should. In this editorial, Dr. Murthy writes, does an apple or many each day keep mortality away? And then despite the recommendation of people actually eating plant-based foods, we think that uh, it may raise potassium, but there's very little evidence to support this, as I mentioned. And I've gone through the literature and compiled all the studies of people eating plant-based foods, and there's really only been one case of someone ever having high potassium. And in this instance, they qualified it because they had a predisposing condition to high potassium, this, ish, this diagnosis called a type 4 RTA, which raises your potassium on its own. And in this case, this person had that, and then it was also eating raw edamame, which is actually one of the most uh, potassium-dense foods on the planet. Uh, so both of these actually predispose to that person to having a high potassium uh, level in their blood. Of the foods with the most potassium, raw edamame uh, comes up in the top 10, if not the top 5. But to round out the list, the other foods include molasses, radishes, uh, potatoes, and then edamame and soybeans. People who've gone from CKD3 to 5 have not had increases in their potassium with eating a plant-based diet. The reason being is that not all potassium sources are the same. Plant-based foods may actually have ways to mitigate the rise in their potassium. That could include the fiber, the natural alkali in these foods, and a couple other things. For the sake of time, I'm going to gloss over the slide. And, um, but this, uh, the, this previous paper and this paper uh, both do a good job explaining why plant-based foods do not cause uh, increases in potassium. And one of the reasons is that plants have cell walls where animals do not. So it's very difficult to get the potassium from plant foods because they have cell walls. And uh, the potassium generally stays locked in those cell walls and is excre excreted with bowel movements. So the amount of potassium that is abs actually absorbed by the body from plant foods is actually no more than 60%. And then similarly, uh, many within the kidney community has, have had concerns about protein from plant foods, which is actually very similar to the concerns that many in the general community have had for years, and it only took decades of uh, discussion to overcome that and eliminate the need, for example, protein complementing and other issues. That myth actually persists within the nephrology literature. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip over these slides, but these slides just discuss that people eating plant-based diets go back, eat, uh, get enough protein um, without kidney disease. The average uh, plant, uh, person eating a plant-based diet is not protein deficient. And then again, the average person who does have kidney disease and does eat a plant-based diet is also not protein deficient. Uh, and actually, eating a, a, a diet that avoids protein excess, like the average omnivorous diet, may actually be beneficial, and like we talked about in the beginning. Eating a plant-based diet has been shown to be a doable, if not beneficial, in people, even on dialysis, who are recommended to eat more protein because of the losses associated with dialysis. An excellent paper, uh, if I may say, is the paper that co-authors and I wrote uh, on this issue, uh, discussing this uh, to debunk these myths that persist about protein in both the uh, general population and those who have kidney disease. So this is the last part, and this is kind of why I am here, and this is why I do what I do. Going back to 2008, I had just finished medical school. I was at the University of Miami. I had no idea what kind of doctor I wanted to become. I think at that time, Will Smith's Welcome to Miami was very popular, so I listened to his song a lot. So that was me back then. And then at that time, I was very interested in kidney transplantation. I've always had this interest in kidney disease. So I started to do research in the field of kidney transplantation, and that was actually my mentor. He was, a, he's a, was and still is a kidney transplant surgeon at Miami. 
One of the reasons I was so interested is there are so many issues surrounding kidney transplantation. There's more people who, who need kidneys, who have kidney failure and need a donor kidney than is available. Um, there's a wait list that spans many years and varies from state to state. This is what it looked like back then. The blue line uh, at the bottom is the number of kidneys that were uh, kidney transplants that were uh, available and actually performed. And then the red line, as you can see, is demand. And demand is, has been much higher and is actually ha was increasing. And this is now, and the demand for kidneys still exceeds the supply. The risk of dying is extremely high. Only 42% of patients live after five years of being on dialysis, which is unfortunate on average. And by comparison, the five-year survival rate for localized lung cancer is 56%. These are just one of many issues in that area. So I did a lot of research on some of these issues and others, and I graduated. And then I felt like I wasn't doing enough, so I deferred residency, went to work on artificial kidneys. And I worked peripherally on this project. I went to the Baylor College of Medicine to uh, do research on this, and I presented. And I learned a couple things, that making an artificial kidney is incredibly hard, if not impossible. It may not happen even in our lifetimes. But more importantly, I learned that the main causes of kidney failure are diabetes and high blood pressure. They are the main causes, but they really are also uh, preventable and modifiable. And it was only through reading the China study that I realized that type 2 diabetes hypertension need not happen, and type 2 diabetes hypertension need not be uncontrolled, and they certainly need not progress and cause kidney failure. To underscore that point, the combined diabetes and high blood pressure cause about 75% of kidney failure. So 47% is diabetes, and another 28% is high blood pressure and they take up three quarters of that pie chart. And 90% of all diabetes type two diabetes and 90% of that is preventable. And similarly, 80% of high blood pressure is preventable. So these diseases certainly need not happen, need not progress and lead to kidney disease. Through the Twitter space, I found this quote, which was uh, very poignant. It's about Christian Barnard, who's a heart transplant surgeon who performed, performed the first heart transplant surgery. And he talks about, I've saved the lives of 150 people by heart transplants. If I had focused on preventive medicine, I might have saved 150 million. That quote actually resonates with me because in my line of work, I, I feel the same way. If we can prevent kidney disease, then we can certainly affect more people than trying to invent an artificial kidney or get them a, a transplant. And it, it certainly is uh, much more beneficial in terms of uh, time and quality of life and patient experience. So ultimately, much of what I do now is, is really this. It's uh, very straightforward to get people from moving from the standard American diet to moving towards a whole food plant-based diet, or at least moving in that direction. Even, even any progress would be beneficial. So there's a lot of people I have to thank for acquiring all this knowledge. This certainly was not a one-person job. And then uh, on that note, I just want to thank all of you for bearing with me and still being awake and not uh, slipping into the, the best sleep of your life. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so the question is, people who drink alcohol um, have liver problems, but do they have kidney problems? People who have liver problems from drinking too much alcohol can then develop kidney problems, but they usually can't just to, they usually don't develop kidney problems on their own unless they're very dehydrated or have some other issue. Yeah, it, it's, it's still mostly liver problems. Yeah, so the question is, why is it taken so long for nephrologists to come around to this? Uh, the comedic answer is that they haven't heard my talk. Um, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but, the, but the serious answer is that um, it's multifactorial, it's complex. Um, there isn't a lot of funding that goes into nephrology. Um, heart attacks and cancer um, have a lot of appeal and they, they get a lot of funding. So we overall just don't have as many studies as say the cardiologists and the cardiology literature reversing heart disease and things like that. Um, the other thing is that uh, without the research, um, we really can't really make PowerPoints like this. It's only after, and so many of these studies were actually done within the last 10 years. So 10 years ago, this, this PowerPoint would have been half as full. Um, the other issue is that um, there hasn't been interest within the community. Um, People never thought you could reverse kidney disease. This is a very new concept. Um, 
so I, I think I think there's people are just now coming around to it for a variety of reasons, and it may be because, for example, the cardiologists maybe have led the way and shown that you can prevent heart disease and even treat it and reverse it. And if we can do that for one organ, why not another? Um, so hopefully in the future we'll catch up and um, have more literature and be able to educate. But now it's not just Hawaii that doesn't have plant-based nephrologists. There's large swaths of the country that don't. I get emails every day from people saying, I'm in this state, do you know anyone? And unfortunately I don't. Uh, but hopefully things catch on and more people uh, read these studies. Um, I think that's half of it. We focus on we read so many studies per day, and then these other ones, which are truly gems, get lost by the wayside, and we forget about them. Why would a pancreas transplant reverse diabetes and chronic kidney disease? Yeah, I was going pretty quick, um, and then so to, to explain that in detail is that some so there's two types of diabetes: type one and type two. To to be very simplistic, type one is autoimmune, and that involves the pancreas uh, uh, being destroyed in this process. So these people, no amount of lifestyle change will reverse underlying disease. It may make it better, um, as many type 1 diabetics have had, but ultimately you, you still need to take insulin or get a new pancreas. So what I was saying is that in these people who got transplanted with a new pancreas who had type 1 diabetes, they also had, um, unfortunately, also kidney disease caused by the diabetes. And the people who got the pancreas transplants as a side effect, a beneficial side effect, actually had a reversal of their kidney disease because they reversed their diabetes with a pancreas transplant. So what in one of the studies, um, Furman and a couple other researchers showed that you can reverse diabetes by eating a whole foods plant-based diet if you're type 2 diabetic. The bulk of kidney disease from diabetes comes from type 2 diabetes. So what I suggest is that if you can reverse type 2 diabetes or whole food plant-based diet and you do have diabetic kidney disease, it may be possible for you to reverse the kidney disease if you reverse the type 2 diabetes with lifestyle change. The question is, if someone gets a kidney transplant, is their, does their life go back to normal or is there still a great decrease in lifespan? Their, their quality of life and duration of life does approach back to normal. Um, there still is a number of things that are involved with a kidney transplant taking immunosuppression, getting blood work, getting checked. Um, there's still no guarantee that the kidney will work. Uh, but for many people, especially those who get a kidney from someone that's a living donor, like a brother or a sister, uh, those kidneys tend to do well, and those patients tend to do well too, and it's considered to be the best option for someone who has kidney failure. Um, so, so there really is no better option than that. And some people do go many decades um, uh, doing just fine. Mahalo to all of you for coming tonight, and have a safe return home. Good night, everyone.